Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the LightCon preview. My name is Maria Cristina Miem. I'm the LightCon project director at Deutsche Messe. Today, it's the 23rd June, and right now, we would have opened the doors to our new uh, International Congress Trade Fair LightCon, uh, the first cross-material and cross-technology platform for lightweight solutions for all user industries. We would have had if the corona crisis didn't force us to postpone the premiere, but as so often new opportunities arise, so I am really glad that we can at least meet virtually today. And uh, yeah, as far as I can see, we have already more than 100 participants. That is great. And hopefully next year on 23rd and 24th June, we can welcome you all here in sunny Hanover. So um, with the LightCon Preview Week, we would like to give you a small foretaste of what LightCon 2021 will be all about in the conference program, but in the exhibition as well. So stay curious. And uh, for today, I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Thanks a lot for being with us. And uh, special thanks to Tassi Lovitte, our speaker, for sharing some of his insights with us. And um, last not least, I would also like to thank our founding partner, Composites United, for the great cooperation and the support in organizing this event. Um, and uh, before we start, I would like to hand over to Dr. Merz from Composites United, right? Yes. Good morning, a warm welcome also from my side on behalf of Composites United. Uh, as Mrs. Mee was saying already today, we had originally planned uh, the opening ceremony of the first LightCon in Hanover with our partner Deutsche Messe AG. Beside top lectures, you would have experienced an exciting exhibition with customer-oriented lightweight solutions. Tonight, we would have celebrated a fantastic evening event and the European Football Championship in parallel. The weather would be perfect, we were ready, but unfortunately we have to postpone the realization of nearly all our plans and also the first light come to next year. However, as we were ready and had a fantastic program in place, we want to present to you now some highlights out of this program to give you on the one side an impression of the quality of lectures you can expect from LightCon, and on the other side to shorten the time until we can meet next year in Hanover face-to-face. -face. We think that the concept of LightCon is a perfect fit to address all requirements for value creation by lightweight technology. Lightweight technology is a key technology based on the new strategy of Composites United and also based on the strategy of the German Ministry of Economics. The overwhelming participation in this LightCon preview week is a proof for the importance of this technology. There are about 1,000 registrations for the LightCon preview week. This is fantastic. And I would like to thank you, especially now today, participating in this very important lecture. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. And thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak here and to do this uh, little presentation and talk a little bit about the manufacturing or more specifically sustainability in aircraft manufacturing and how we approach this topic in general. Because if we are talking about sustainability in aircraft manufacturing, there are actually two major questions or two major parts that I want to talk about today. The first is, how to know that we are doing the right thing. And the second is um, what we actually do to increase the sustainability specifically of composites right now and these days. And to know how to know we, that we are doing the right thing is one of the most crucial questions for us at the moment. Because we, how do we assess sustainability at the moment? I don't think I'm talking, telling you anything new that at the moment, the life cycle assessments in general is the crucial tool for that. And we're looking at the different branches and the different, industri uh, the different industries and specifically at the different life cycle phases. And for us, it is not only a matter of manufacturing, sustainability in manufacturing, but sustainability of the entire life cycle phase. Because we have to be very careful if we do anything to a specific part, 
in our production phase, um, how this is going to impact the use phase of our aircraft. And especially after that, um, how do we do the recycling of such materials, specifically the composites that we've been using so much in the last decade at least, um, using it since 1980s in the VTPs of our aircraft. And still at the moment, this is a material that only recently has been solved on how to recycle these materials. Um, so right now, the question that we are asking us is how do we assess and how, what is the ecological impact of the manufacturing of an aircraft? And approaching with, let's say, standard life cycle assessment tools, we are currently trying, or we have been in the past trying to track down the material breakdown of our former aircraft, like the A320, A330, and at the moment doing the same thing for the most recent aircraft, the A350, that we are, uh, is basically 53% composite materials. And if we look at that, we're trying to look at the materials um, that go and the energy that go into component manufacturing, um, what logistic aspects we have, what fuel use in the operations phase we have, what maintenance, um, the airport construction, and I'll go a little bit deeper into that because this is not a usual aspect of life cycle assessment, and what kind of end of life scenarios we have. And we can do get get to a very specific material breakdown for each of our aircraft, so we can very clearly say um, what they consist of and how you can take out take apart each element of this aircraft and try to recycle it in the best manner possible. And because we've been talking about aircraft, in sometimes not in the best light in the past. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an actual clue on how, what the consumption of an aircraft or the use of flying aircraft is. Because in the end, um, it, it comes down to the aircraft efficiency and the passengers we have. And, well, and a couple of other aspects that I'm going to do, dive into in a couple, a couple of slides later. But just to get these numbers into your heads, um, I'm comparing here two types of data sets, one from the Lufthansa, which is, um, let's say, practical data, and one from the DLR, um, which is, uh, I'd call, academia data. And both of these values, so data set one, short haul from uh, Berlin to Köln, with roughly 5.39 liters per person, 100 person kilometers. And this is just uh, the, typical uh, value that you would probably see in a car um, because it's how many liters of fuel do we burn per 100 kilometers per person since we do carry a little bit more than the five people we, we carry around in our cars. And I think the interesting um, thing here to see is that first of all the short hauls consume a little bit more than the long hauls due to the overall efficiency of the aircraft and the flight itself. Um, and the range that we are talking about, that we're between four and 5.4 liters, and that both the, both these data sets are pretty much the same values that we, is, we are seeing here. So <clears throat> I th think it's nice to know that we're not talking about like 20 liters per 100 kilometers, but it's actually in the range of a very efficient modern car that we're talking about. And this has been developing in the a lot in the past. Um, the first aircraft have been much less efficient. And but with the recent A350-800-900-1000, um, we are ranging, uh, getting to kind of a plateau on what we can do in terms of uh, efficiency. And at the moment, this is a lot attributed to, to the aerodynamics of the aircraft attributed, but mostly, and this is very crucial, mostly uh, attributed to the uh, engine efficiency, since that is where we burn most of the fuel, <laughs> where we burn our fuel. Um, but what I wanted to have us think a little bit about uh, as well is that in the typical life cycle assessment that we are talking about, we're mostly talking about the production phase, the use phase, the recycling phase, but very little about the actual infrastructure. And 
this is one of the aspects where, while having a couple of other drawbacks, um, the aviation industry really has some advantages, especially if we're talking about regions where you don't have anything else to, to travel on. And the idea that I was uh, always pondering that is, imagining an island and a couple of people sitting down uh, and having like these palm leaves and just all of a sudden one of these palm leaves would uh, two two such palm leaves would grow together and they have basically realized that wow when the wind is blowing over there there's some lift and a couple of hundred years later they have developed a whole entire civilization that's just flying around and just think how would the world around us look if we don't have any roads if we don't have any yeah, such uh, in influence in our an environment, in our surroundings. And that was what made me think uh, that we need to assess the infrastructural impact of our different methods of transportation a little bit more. But to be honest, this is not an easy task because um, if we want to do a life cycle assessment on that, on that frame, you got to get the data for that and you got to get the people to work on that. And the challenge is mostly that we're talking about two kind of two different ranges of and a different huge range of analysis that we want to do. So we don't want to do this only from the beginning of our production cycle to the end of our production cycle or from the beginning of the production cycle to the recycling of the part later on. But we want to do it cradle to cradle and we want to do it in the best case, not only cradle to cradle, but in a circular economy, seeing how we can reuse the material, what the reuse and recycling aspect processes have for an impact. And that is currently what we are trying to achieve, trying to get a full overview. And the different, the second point, and um, I have to uh, say this is a little bit of a personal opinion in our and that that we are having in our surrounding here is um, a little bit of a dislike for the um, CO2 equivalents, and simply because they are for me not very tangible, and um, allow a little bit less comparison between a couple of different factors and just here when we try to interpret that when we try to get a clear idea and compare it between different modes of travel for example the best thing that we found is energy and talking about the accumulated energy value of such materials and yeah and <clears throat> luckily there has been have been processes developed that or methods and models developed that can actually assess the impact of an aircraft of the infrastructure on cars on aircraft and on trains and this has been done to a certain extent and i would uh, will in a second give you just this key idea because um this is a, uh, just to comment a little bit on that those are these are data from the u.s transportation research um they are U.S. data, so they have a little bit of a different um, environment than we have here in Europe, meaning they have more air travel, more buses, and uh, much less train travel, um, simply because train traveling is not that developed. And um, also, just to keep that in mind, they drive a little bit different style of cars than we do here. And this um, Analysis has tried to take into account all these aspects that I've mentioned, not only the operation, the manufacturing, but also the up, um, logistics, the infrastructure, and everything around the vehicle. And just that maybe that most important point that I wanted to point out here, or that I would like to hint you on is that currently when we're talking about the energy per person kilometer travel, um, we can compare different SUV, different modes of transport here. And what they've done, and here it's very obviously pointed out, the one person traveling in a car, especially the one person traveling in alone in an SUV in a, in a city environment is using up a lot of energy. And this is why we think, I think we just keep in mind that sharing cars can actually be very, very beneficial overall, since you can even get an SUV down to be comparably efficient per person if you just share the car. Um, but what we also wanted to point out, or what I like to point out is that with a regional jet or a single aircraft, we're actually 
not far up top on this list, but we were somewhere in the good middle. And um, I think that is uh, that was quite revealing for me when we found these kind of papers. Uh, just know, I know that coming from that industry, you probably have a little bit of a confirmation bias, but um, at least we can we can confirm these data from a couple of other sources as well. And that is at least a good idea on how, good to have a proper view on this whole aspect of how do we assess the sustainability of the aircraft. But that is just to get you, get you into the feeling of how this is generally being done and what aspects we are talking about and to give you that don't drive alone in an SUV vibe. But um, we want to go show you a little bit more specifically what we're doing at the moment. Because um, simply said, in the end, uh, it's, it is mainly about what we can influence right now is mainly about those three phases, the production phase, the operation phase, the end of life phase. And for the operation of phase, this, it is crucial what we do because anything that is being done in the production phase will impact the operation phase ascent throughout its entire life. And here we have a couple of uh, aspects that we don't want to hear or we don't want to see when we're talking about sustainable aviation. Because I know that everybody is complaining about the seat density that we have at the moment. But just imagine that within an air, the same aircraft that has carried some rough, roughly 190 aircraft, 20 year, uh, 190 people 20 years ago, is now theoretically capable of uh, carrying up to 240 something people. So that is in, within the same space, you would fit in a lot more people bringing down the overall per person kilometer or per, per energy used per person a lot. And that is only through to a better and more efficient use of the aircraft itself. Um, that's something that I personally have to remind myself next time that I will be sitting down in the aircraft and want to complain about um, anything there. Um, because this is the best thing we can do besides increasing the engine efficiency at the moment. Here, it's very simple. Thrust per kilogram of fuel is the crucial factor. And in the end, and that is, this is what our industry and specifically the composite industry is about, the aircraft weight. Because in the end, it's it's aircraft net weight. Sure, that's uh, something that we as an engineer, aircraft engineer have to tackle. It's the fuel, it's the passenger weight, it's consumables and cargo. This is what makes up the total travel weight. And um, as a passenger, as a, as a human being that is trying to do something good for the environment, um, we have to think about what we actually do since uh, passenger weight consumables and fuel are directly impacted by us, how we enter the aircraft, how much luggage we bring. But we all do all of this. Um, and since we, we want to improve the aircraft ever more, um, the introduction of composites was one of the crucial factors in bringing, bringing the aircraft overall weight down. And here, um, yeah, and this is what I will be going into in, for a couple of minutes later on. Uh, in a second. The last thing here in this general area that I wanted to talk about is the problems that we're facing in improving the sustainability because just take a couple of um, major aspects like the noise impact, the local air quality and the climate impact and the different aspects of uh, air travel that we can modify, like we can engine, engineer improved nacelles, can reduce the noise, but if we do that, everybody around the aircraft, out on the airport will be happy, um, but which will, it would lead to locally local worsening of the air quality and the climate in general due to more CO2 burn. And this way, I'm not going going to go through this list. You will be provided this, and it's uh, specifically it's this, uh, also coming from the DLR. So I would recommend you to check this out just to give get an idea of what the difference, uh, what the different elements are that we try to steer to to be a very good, efficient aircraft, but where we have actual challenges and actual contradictions, what we can do, and. To take this to a very clear example, 
um, we have the aircraft cabin, and this is one of my other areas that I'm working in a lot. Um, here we are talking in talking a lot about the eco efficiency of the cabin, and a very obvious first um, discussion point has been the introduction of natural fibers to replace the widely used glass fibers. Like, can't you use hemp fibers? Can't you use um, ziza, whatever co natural fibers? One of the let's keep it to that general category, and. The problem here is that yes, of course, we can theoretically use natural fibers to replace glass fibers, but um, this would have, due to the low performance of um, these fibers, would have a direct impact on the sizing and the designing of the part, resulting in a little bit heavier part. And this little bit heavier part is very likely to generate so much additional fuel burn, even if it's just a couple of hundred grams, that it's very, very hard to uh, save all everything that has been saved in the production phase through the operations phase of the aircraft and not end up with something that has been, um, in the end, turns out to be worse than if we hadn't done anything. So on the other hand, we're talking about, for example, introducing the introduction of bio-based resins to replace phenolic resins. And that is just from my experience with people talking about it, that is much less sexy than uh, using natural fibers in the aircraft. But it's something that is, uh, has very little impact on our business since it's, the resins would act the same way as today's resins do, has additional benefits like um, equivalent weight, it uh, is REACH compliant, which phenolic resins might not be in the future. And overall, we have benefit of this whole endeavor. And this is maybe a very good example of why we need to actually assess what we want to do, because what is obvious here might not be beneficial. And the last thing I want to do and the last thing we want to do is introduce something, do something to increase the sustainability of manufacturing, increase the sustainability of our parts and end up being worse than before. So. What do we do to, to improve the um, sustainability of composites right now? Um, I'm not going to, going to present you all the composite recycling activities that we've done. I would refer to another presentation that we've given in 2017 um, and that has been presented a couple of times since then, basically showing all the matters that, that we do with recycling. So, Key fact is we know how to recycle composites. We know how to, to use pyrolysis to recover the carbon fibers. And currently the issue that we are trying to tackle is not recycling in general, but what to do with the material that comes out of it, because in the end we need to close the circle. And this is what you can see here. A lot of different investigations that have been trying to, or that have in parts also uh, worked out because we're currently already using reused material in the aircraft. Um, and specifically, for example, what what we are reviving at the moment is the recycled cabin lining. Um, we've worked on high performance materials, we've worked on uncured prepregs, um, putting them into sheet moldings, putting them into bulk molding compounds. We've worked with aircraft parts, we've worked with non-aircraft parts, <laughs> very non-aircraft parts. And this is what we're trying to do at the moment. And the issue for us here is that um, the market is contradictory um, because we have for our, our market, for our aviation industry, we have a very high performance demand, but a very low volume that we might apply. Um, but there are other markets that might have uh, less high performance requirements. Um, maybe the, this is why we are targeting the interior at the moment. Um, we can introduce recycled carbon fibers into the inter interior due to their lower high performance requirement and the adequately higher um, amount of application. But the biggest market for any reco recovered such material is actually high in volume, but low in performance. So um, filler materials, injection moldings, short fiber reinforcement, in the worst case, it's even dust. Um, but that is where most of the bulk would go. So 
what we are trying to bring to bring this or improve this is work on the performance of these materials. The most important aspect that we're currently already working on together with Japanese partners is um, increasing the alignment of uh, increasing the alignment of recycled fibers to have something that is close to uh, or, or virgin carbon fiber. We're working with applications not in the aircraft, but in the manufacturing environment, since uh, this is where we can very easily integrate this right away um, without any major qualification issue during the next years. One of the biggest projects that we've initiated and that is running right now is, has, is the search for N350 end of life solutions, specifically working together with the European Union and the Clean Sky 2 organization. Um, we initiate, it was initiated that uh, during the next three years, there will be a call, there will be a project working on the specific aspect of how do we dismantle and how do we recycle the A350. And from there on, um, right now we go and dive into the manufacturing sites themselves. So we're trying to find out whether um, improving the insulation of a uh, factory is more beneficial than introducing the heating method or basically getting a clear idea, um, developing a Sankey diagram of the energy flow of factories to get a clear idea of where the issues are, where the major energy consumers are and to be to know that we are also uh, also in that area working at the right points. Um, then we have the aspect of re-recycling because uh, very little has been talked about composite recycling in the second or third generation of recycling because at the moment we know that we can recover a long short fiber from an endless fiber composite but we have very little done little research about this what happens with the recycled parts that's going to be recycled again how can we avoid degradation of the fiber length as much as possible or if we cannot avoid it um, how do we how do we treat this and going down that same slope uh, in the end there will be some kind of materials that we won't be able to recycle and there is some material that is maybe heavily polluted, maybe more or less grinded down to dust. Um, and there will be some kind of CFRP that we need to dispose of safely and securely and as we can. And as recent investigations have shown, um, this is something where there's also a little bit need for work on. And just summing up, the, uh, giving you last little overview before coming to an end here. Um, if we're talking about this whole issue, we're talking about in the typical manner of the reduced re waste hierarchy. Um, and what we're currently targeting is, well, reduce, that's very obvious. That's something that is, has a direct impact on our own business. That's something we, we're doing intrinsically. Um, but the reuse and the recycling market had to be developed and have still to be developed. And this means at the moment, and we're talking a lot about non-aerospace application and non-flying application, and very slowly starting to get actual flying aircraft in flying recycled materials into the aircraft. What has been very little in investigated is the recovery and well, uh, due to recent findings, um, the area of disposal will have to be reopened. And it's simple, we do net shape manufacturing, we increase the carbon fiber manufacturing itself, so direct heating input, increase the throughput of such materials. For the reuse, we're talking about marketplaces where we can uh, like offer uh, what, what is my waste could be your raw, raw material. Um, maybe we're trying to improve on that direct re and direct reuse technologies. Um, especially the focus is on uh, indirect production facilities, so toolings, jigs, because we use that a lot and we use it a lot in carbon fiber as well. Um, for the recycling, um, to be honest, the biggest issue is the acceptance of customers, um, of the companies, of the OEMs, because um, most likely you know that we don't have an issue with the 
fiber itself. We know what kind of performance this fiber would bring. And we have a huge amount of ideas of what we can do with this. Um, just with the, in the recent past, my personal opinion was that there has simply been too little, too little willingness to introduce these materials and to actually tackle these challenges that we have when we introduce the recycled materials, maybe because it might have a little bit less uh, stable supply chain than we have for virgin materials that have been in use for 20 years. But this is something finally these years we are talking about actually uh, covering these challenges. And at the moment, I'm pretty happy that um, we are starting to actually use recycled carbon fibers in right now in the production environment. And what I just wanted to remind us all is that we shouldn't forget the auxiliary, auxiliary materials recycling or reuse since that is an area that I've seen very little discussion going on about, but in terms of the waste amount is crucial um, because we are talking about composite, nicely comp recycled composites while producing a huge amount of plastic waste. Um, Recovery has also been almost no research in the recent past. Um, this is just something I would like to want to highlight here because um, it is a part of our waste hierarchy. And while not being what we really want to do, for some elements, it might be one of the only things that we can do because it come, boils down to an elemental recovery of the materials. And this is what um, we could do instead of just trying to improve the burning of our CFRP waste, we could try to tackle the elemental recovery of these materials. And well, the final issue is the disposal. At the moment, um, we are assuming that co-incineration in calcium carbide plants is the only feasible route of recycling or uh, of disposing carbon fibers. But we are also working in different uh, other areas because specifically the, for example, most interesting for me is looking at the microbial degradation of organic wastes, the resins, um, to be able to talk about something like a CFRP compost. And this is actually feasible. Um, this has been shown for PET materials that that can do this. And now it might be possible for uh, composite waste as well. Yeah, and to bring this a little bit to an end, um, life cycle assessment, while sounding less sexy than bio-based materials, is a crucial tool. And uh, I need to remind this myself. I, in originally didn't wasn't too much of a fan of uh, this whole LCA movement, but really it is the tool that we need to use to assess if we are doing the right thing. And for an, for an aircraft for sustainable sustainable aviation, this means looking at the operation phase of the aircraft because it is where we produce our major impact on the environment but do a fair assessment, include the impact of infrastructure um, and remember, remind yourself if we're talking about something that is replaceable. So when we have um, helicopter travel in remote regions, long distance, very, very long distances, um, is, would the car actually be an alternative? Then remind yourself that you matter. Think twice when packing. Um, every kilogram that you pack into your backpack um, will be added to the overall weight of the aircraft and with the, the overall weight of the aircraft is calculated to know the amount of fuel so for every gram of material that you pack that is not necessary we're adding a little bit of fuel to carry that around just remind yourself of it and we the aviation industry know when flying doesn't make sense and we have a very good uh, here in Germany a very good example from that for one of the major commutes between Cologne Bonn and Frankfurt where Lufthansa uh, actively developed together with the Deutsche Bahn a high-speed train connection for the aircraft itself um, the composites enable a lighter aircraft and that is due to the heavy impact of the operations phase the crucial impact that we can bring to the table. Composites are lightweight and we make the aircraft lightweight. Um, and by now composites can be recycled and high performance applications have been shown and are in development. And due to the major discussion that is going on, 
biomaterials have their place, but it has to be the right one. Don't just use bio-based instead of an industrial material if you're not sure that you can prove that this is actually beneficial. Um, bio-based in itself is nothing that brings yeah, benefit to the table, or not in, not in the sense that it's been talked about. And developing a circular economy from composites is possible, but we need more work. We need to improve the segregation, which is a homework for all the work producers of waste. We need to actually target, and this is what has been called out within Airbus, we are targeting 100% recycling. We're not going to do any, any landfilling, even in the countries where they would allow it, we will not landfill CFRP waste. And we should avoid downcycling. And personal opinion, we need to work a little bit more on technologies for material recovery on an elemental level, since that is uh, the, the most common denominator between all these, what these materials are made of. Yeah, and I think, uh, no watch in sight. I hope uh, you had a little bit of, uh, this was an interesting peek uh, into how we think about this whole area of sustainable aviation, how we uh, think about it in terms of composite manufacturing and how these two major keywords kind of relate. And with this, I will thank you for, for the time. Thank you for coming here and uh, spending the time to listen. Mm -hmm.